In this chapter, you will learn about the scientific methods for studying haptic perception, perceptual illusions in haptics, and how GFF devices are used in perception studies. Research on human touch is a major gateway for the progress of haptics and the conception of novel GFF devices. In turn, GFF devices are commonly used to push the boundaries of our knowledge about the sense of touch, since they can precisely control stimuli and measure user motion and or force. They also help us create stimuli that do not normally present in the physical world. In this chapter, we first introduce methods that are used for studying human touch. Then we will show how haptic technology and particular GFF devices can be used in touch perception experiments. To study human perception, researchers rely on a set of established procedures that are known as the psychophysical methods. The origins of psychophysics trace back to the 19th century, when Weber made the first experiments for quantifying the human perception of touch and light. Later, Gustav Fechner completed and extended Weber's work in his Elements of Psychophysics. In scientific literature, psychophysics refers to the quantitative investigation of mechanisms that are involved in detecting and processing information within the human nervous system. The basic assumption of these methods is that the physical properties of a signal, such as light or force in the real world, are captured by human sensory receptors, such as the eyes or tactile receptors in the skin. The activity of these receptors is transmitted to the peripheral and central nervous systems, where it is assessed by metacognitive brain processes before the stimulus is reported. Psychophysical methods typically focus on controlling the physical properties of the signal and accurately recording the elicited report of the sensation. The collected data is used to interpret the cognitive processes at play and make predictions about the observer's behavior in related circumstances of everyday life. Our sensory receptors are not perfect. They have limited resolution. One interesting question for researchers is how much one should change the physical stimulus, such as a light or force for humans to be able to detect that there was a change. This value is called the just noticeable difference, or JND, of the stimulus. A central concept in JND studies is the psychometric function, which captures the probability for humans to detect differences in a physical stimulus. The psychometric curve shows the probability of discriminating stimuli of various intensities from a reference stimulus that stays the same throughout the entire experiment. Typically, the larger the difference between the comparison and the reference stimuli, the higher the probability of discrimination. Scientific articles commonly use the 75% probability line for reporting the JND value. In this case, the JND is the difference between the physical characteristics of the comparison and the reference stimuli that is detected at 75% of the time. However, researchers can decide to use the other probability thresholds, such as 60% or 90% to define the JND. Psychophysical methods are numerous. Choosing the right method depends on the scientific question at hand, the capabilities of the experimental apparatus, and fatigue experienced by the participants. Many reviews and textbooks about the psychophysical methods are available. A classical textbook is Psychophysics by Kingdom and Prinz that also includes an open-source MATLAB toolbox. Another influential review topic is the Psychophysical Methods for Haptics by Jones and Tan. Here we introduce three classical psychophysical procedures. 1. The method of limits that is fast but prone to bias. 2. The constant stimuli method that is more robust but requires long experiments. And 3. Adaptive methods that are optimized for tracking the just noticeable difference. The method of limits is based on alternating series of increasing and decreasing differences between the stimuli. In each block, the difference between the comparison stimulus and the reference is either continuously increased until the observer reports that they have become different, or the difference is continuously decreased until the observer reports that the two stimuli have become identical. After a few blocks, the mean of the transition points is calculated as the threshold. This technique is fast, but it depends on the internal criterion of the observer about what is considered a significant difference. In practice, the method of limits is often used to obtain a quick estimate of the sensory threshold. This first estimate is then used as a starting point for a more thorough method usually the constant stimuli or adaptive methods. For example, in this study, the experimenters used a custom experimental setup that coupled a phantom premium device to a custom-built wearable thimble to study human perception of frictional changes during haptic exploration. At first, they used a method of limits to compute rough JND estimates that were later used to calibrate comparison stimuli for the method of constant stimuli. 
In the constant stimuli method, the experimenter presents a predefined set of comparison stimuli to the observer in random order. In each trial, the observer is presented with two stimuli and is asked to say if they are the same or different. The observer is unaware which stimulus is the reference. This method requires the experimenters to define a small set of stimuli around the sensory threshold beforehand. Therefore, they need to have the preliminary estimate of the sensory threshold. The psychometric function is computed based on the proportion of correct answers for each comparison with the reference. Thus, to obtain a good estimate, the experimenters need to run a large number of repetitions, typically from 10 to 20, for each stimulus pair. So if they want to test only 10 predefined values, at least 100 trials are needed. For example, in the previous study, the researchers used the method of limits to choose the boundaries for comparison. They did this in order to have between a 10 and 90% probability that the participants signified more friction. Next, they used the method of constant stimuli. In each trial, participants had to detect the stimulus with higher friction. This method and the computed probabilities for each pair of stimuli enabled them to fit a psychometric curve to determine 75% just noticeable difference for perceiving an increase in friction. In addition, they could show that the JND depends on the reference friction. The just noticeable difference is often independent of the reference stimuli, but it is not always the case as we saw in this example. With the same method, researchers have estimated the key parameters for GFF devices. For example, the minimum force resolution that a user can perceive when interacting with a GFF device is 7% of the reference force. Another type of psychophysical method is adaptive methods. Here, the intensity of the stimulus is changed depending on the participant's response in their previous trials in order to reduce the length of the experiment and the participant's fatigue. A common family of adaptive methods is the staircase methods, since in these methods, the sequence of comparison stimuli values look like a staircase. Here, the presentation sequences of stimuli within the staircases are designed to converge at a specific JND that is not always equivalent to the 75% probability threshold. Many scientific studies use the adaptive staircase methods. One example staircase method is the one up, three down staircase. In this method, the difference between the reference and the comparison stimulus is increased by a predefined step after each incorrect answer by the participant. However, the comparison stimuli is only decreased if the participant gives three consecutive correct answers. This method targets the 79.4% probability threshold on the psychometric curve that is computed by averaging the mean of the peaks and valleys in the staircase sequence. Adaptive methods converge faster than other methods, but this speed also comes with some drawbacks. Since they do not estimate the full shape of the psychometric function, the curve is only precise in a narrow band around the sensory threshold. Some haptic devices are not able to implement the constant steps that are required for the methods to work. And lastly, participants might guess the staircase logic or exceed the predefined boundaries of the simulation levels. Here is an example of a study in which the authors used the Phantom Premium device to study the haptic perception of force direction. Specifically, they measured the J and D in the force angle. Their experiment used the adaptive method that starts at a given angle difference. The difference value is increased after each incorrect response and decreased after three consecutive correct responses. At first, the magnitude is changed by big steps, and after a few mistakes, smaller steps are used to fine-tune the threshold estimate. This example illustrates that the choice of a psychophysical method for conducting a perception study is experiment-specific and informed by the scientific goal of the study as well as the specificities of the scientific apparatus. Past perception studies inform us about the human sensitivity to key parameters of haptic exploration, such as force, pressure, friction, and temporal resolution of haptic sensations. The knowledge of these parameters provide guidelines for the design and creation of new haptic devices. Designing haptic technology and sensations that meet human haptic sensing and output thresholds is extremely challenging. To make the matter more complex, our haptic perception is influenced by the presence of stimuli from other senses, as well as by perceptual illusions. For example, a study by Ernst and Banks shows that we integrate information from visual and haptic channels in a manner that is optimal for reducing perceptual noise. When the visual channel is noisy, humans rely on haptic information for size estimation and vice versa. So when a haptic device is not perfect according to our sensing thresholds, vision can become the dominant source of perceptual information. Human perception is also subject to illusions. All of our senses can be fooled into perceiving things differently from reality. 
These illusions are also a great way to learn about how the human brain functions and processes sensory information. There are many well-known visual illusions on color and shape. For example, which of the A and B squares are darker to you? Did you perceive A as darker? In fact, your brain is playing a trick on you. Drawing a bar between the two squares breaks the illusion, and we can see that both squares are of the same color. Many haptic illusions have been discovered, too. You can find an extended review of these illusions in a 2011 paper by Lederman and Jones. Some haptic illusions do not require a complex setup to be experienced. For example, in the cutaneous rabbit illusion, when two or more locations on the wrist to forearm are repeatedly tapped in a quick succession, the person feels hops regularly progressing along the forearm. Similarly, there are many illusions of weight. For example, studies have shown that when two objects have the same weight, the smaller object is perceived as heavier than the larger one. One striking illusion is the bumps and holes illusion. This illusion shows that if the force of the finger mimics one experienced by a bump or a hole, humans will feel the force shape regardless of the actual geometry of the surface. This illusion extends as far as to turn a geometric hole to be perceived as a bump and vice versa. To study this illusion, the experimenters had to design a novel custom-built GFF device that could render contact forces regardless of the user's motion. You may have noticed that a running perceptual haptic study requires a reliable setup for presenting the stimuli. How do cognitive scientists choose a haptic device to tackle a given scientific question? Many parameters are considered when selecting or building haptic devices for an experiment. Technical parameters include range of motion, position and force resolution, reliability of the output, and absence of artifacts. From the practical point of view, affordability, obtainability, ease of building, and using the device can also be decisive factors. Typical examples of highly reliable GFF hardware with accurate position sensing and high force resolution are devices from the Phantom Premium series. However, they are also expensive and complex. For some projects, cheaper devices with a good trade-off, like the Novant Falcon, can be easily obtained or bought. Finally, some cutting-edge experiments require custom-built devices that are specifically developed for a project. These devices are complex and time-consuming to develop, but they also push the boundaries of haptic research and engineering. In this chapter, you learned about three psychophysical methods that are commonly used by hapticians. Haptic illusions, with examples from the literature, and the common considerations when choosing a GFF device for an experiment. As an assignment for this chapter, design a haptic experiment that estimates the just noticeable difference for the stiffness of a virtual wall with GFF devices. What psychophysical method would you use and why? Find potential devices for the experiment on Haptopedia and justify your choice. What limitations, biases, and confounds can prevent you from finding the true JND for stiffness?